what we were doing. <coughs> that wasn't all the sentence. About life's interest, <laughs> about life's interest, about an individual's interest and how they might mingle, how they might engage in impersonation, and how they might even separate. And particularly, well, last time, if I remember correctly, I think that's what people do and I know on stage they say things like, I remember, if I remember correctly, which is interesting because you're, you know, the person either doesn't, and they're, well, they're either doing it for some kind of dramatic effect or else they don't remember what they were doing last. And if so, why the hell did anybody show up to see them? Where are you going to say, yeah, it was just a few hours ago. You forgot what you were doing? Back on the subject, please. All right. If I remember correctly, what we were talking about was how if a revolutionist, somebody trying to operate in their own private, rebellious, neural manner, and they had some sort of private interest in what we were doing was trying to see that it goes on, that life has its own interest, people pursue life's own interest, ha ha ha, and oft times will either pursuing their own, and from some views you could even make out a case which the intellect of humanity has been doing off and on for thousands and thousands of years in the world of academia and around some of the better mahogany bars here and there <laughs> of deciding well we all are prisoners of destiny of fat fate and our genetics and all of that and therefore there's very little we can do then the possibility normally reserved to those in the world pursuing real apparent religious interest who say, well, maybe we don't have complete freedom, but at least we got the freedom to fight against evil, stupidity, bad haircuts. But we were considering the possibility that someone might be able to pursue their own interest and that their own interest might appear to be, especially verbally, quite similar to what life is doing, except there is a dissimilarity that is not normally talked about. Would you care to point out why? Sure. Nobody ever notices it. Ah. So we were talking specifically such things as if a man decided, if his interest was charitable to such a degree that he was going to try and help the watchless. We imagine that uh, life's interest, as we described it earlier, a week or so ago, had decided to propose legislation, as a matter of fact, to bring about control over the personal ownership of timepieces, and then we were imagining on that this legislation had become a fait accompli and we now had strict control over watches and therefore there would be, as always the case, people in the kingdom without watches. And so we'll decide that this one man, through the great goodness of his heart and perhaps other internal problems, had decided my interest in life is to help the watchless. If a man is going to pursue such charitable interest, as indeed any interest, but we're using this as an example that usually catches people's attention, especially those whose name begins, last name begins with Schweitzer, and sister and mother and all that. that. I was pointing out that if a revolution is going to pursue this kind of interest, he should act, not think. He should do, don't talk. And that's about where we left it last time, and that was good enough for me, so we'll leave it there this time. So. Uh, we'll have... I think Mrs. Uttlemeyer brought her portable piano and she will play some renditions for the remainder of the program and I'll see you next time. Nah, I wouldn't do that too. Uh, well, while we're here, by the way, there is a crude reflection of this very thing that we're talking about that continues to pop up. It is a prayer. I think it's known referred to in the city and it's even beyond a prayer now. It has reached the high level of being put on little pieces, printed on little pieces of plastic, and hang behind the counter in dry cleaner establishments. But it was normally, I think it was first presented as a prayer about, give me the power to change that which I can. Give me the grace to accept those things I cannot change and give me the wisdom to know the difference, which is you know, a hell of a lot of gills. You know, give me, give me. <laughs> I might also point out that if there's any validity in any of this, the Rev, 
the real revolutionists can't depend on the gimmies and the gills, you know, give, give, you know. If there's something to be done, he's got to do it. But at any rate, notice, and I'm not laughing because if we were, if you were children and we were still dealing with factions and sects and religions and cultures, which is, has their place. Remember, Kairut even pointed out, it's to encourage, to help little nippers think. Of course, there are a lot of little nippers on this planet. And they do not all wear little Buster Brown clothes. And, but at any rate, the prayer. Uh, has deep roots into the energy flow in a three-dimensional world. And it does reflect in a way that is pretty inclusive if you were away from the idea of actually thinking that you were appealing to forces outside a system. At least outside a system in some anthropomorphic way. That you were, if you were a 5D creature, that you think you're appealing to at least a 6D creature. But in some way the 6D creature can come in and directly go, hey, which they can't. Matter of mathematics, matter of physics, it's a matter of something else. I forgot the name of it. But the prayer is a very pregnant, though crude, which I leave it to you to find any possible synonymous relation, but it is a potent reflection in a crude way of what we're talking about. To say, give me the power to change what I should or can, which is another story. I think it normally says that which I should, but you could look at it another way and say, change that which I can. But in the city, that would even give more problems than staying there reading that prayer while simultaneously trying to figure out how in the world can it be $22 for four dresses and two pair of pants? <laughs> but it's saying, give me, give me the power to change that which I can or should. Give me the grace to accept those things which I can't and give me the wisdom you know, not to waste my damn time on you know, trying to change things I can't. And it sounds, it has at a very crude level. And I know in the city it can pass for being a pretty high class level, a pretty spiritual level. It could even, I could make an, even a non-spiritual intellectual defense of it. But it is really talking about acting and not thinking. But since, at the ordinary level, that is not de rigueur for people, for ordinary men, it is not required that there be some specific way in which people, off on their own, if they were deciding, or had been decided for them, let's don't worry about the words, that they were going to pursue, pursue something on their own, is they've got to do it. Not fall on their knees and pray about it, not talk about it, not even think about it. You can't limit it to that. And so it is an expanded version, crude enough, that if you look at the prayer and you think about it, it doesn't matter your religious persuasion, it will almost give you a kind of internal carte blanche to do nothing. Well, I say nothing, we'll get to that in a minute. But do recall, it, that's a hell of a lot of gills in one prayer. Three of them. But it sounds, if you don't look at it, or if you are not capable of looking at it outside the limits of where it was presented, that is, if you cannot look at it, a 3D prayer outside of a 3D context, it really goes nowhere. It can drive you back. If you're ordinary, it could drive you back into the closet, back on your knees, back to the point of, you know, que sera, you know, who knows? I did my best. The question never arises, I did my best for whom? I did my best for life's interest or my interest? Uh, I can't resist. Well, I'm here. You might make one other note since I brought up prayer. It's just one example. But it's a first class one that crosses all of the great elementary school boundary lines between religions and cultures and etc. But you might care to note that even in the singularities that are human, such as prayer, and as far as you know, in a 3D universe, there is no other creature dealing with prayer such things. Just one example, but since I brought it up, I couldn't resist pointing out here that in such areas, in such secondary activities, it would seem to be as singular as prayer. Note this, it's never been noted, that the creator of a thing, 
Whoever made up that prayer, for instance, that the creator of a thing gets out of it that which is never available to any subsequent user. Boy, I wish I hadn't brought that up tonight. <laughs> you go with it. It's a fact. Not psychological, not spiritual. It has to do with how energy works, and it has to do with the particular, you might say, voltage of energy. Because once somebody has created something, and it's not just a prayer. I just If somebody creates something, and to them they got something out of it, which really is a self-referring definition of a creation. I don't mean by some critical acclaim that you paint something, you draw something, you write a song, you even think something. You create it as far as you know. We're not debating that. And you got something out of it. But then it even seeps in to the equation outside of you and to other people that you did paint something and other people began to admire it. It becomes, in a sense, famous. The prayer got passed around. No matter how sincere, as they call it, I believe still in the city, don't they? Yes, they do, he said. How sincere may be the followers of it, the subsequent users of the prayer, of looking at the painting, of listening to the symphony, no matter what they seem to get out of it, it is never, 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 ever of the same potency that the originator of what he or she got out of it. The best, no matter what you do, whether it be a prayer, a book, an idea, no matter what the subsequent followers, users of it get, it's always a matter of leftovers, and I'm not meaning this as, as you should know as a uh, pejorative comment on people because they may get something out of it, but at best compared to what the originator got. What they're getting is leftovers. They're getting uh, at the very best a poor imitation. And it's no one's fault. It has nothing to do with human blame. Uh, I said I couldn't resist bringing that up because you have people dealing with all the way from secular to apparently metaphysical, transcendental, intellectual, philosophical matters looking to the past. And I know that between Kairut and you people and me, it's, at times it sounds like you kick around history. If it was just a casual person, a carpenter riding by on a slow horse and listening, you think, well, all this is is some other group of people sitting around making fun of all the rest of the people. It's not. But if you're trying to learn something, and so far as looking at history, I know it can be interesting, whether it was the Middle Ages, whether it was... 3,000 years ago, or whether it was last week, whether it was yesterday. As much you can find interest. It can be a hobby. But if it's already been done, you cannot get out of whatever it was, what the originator, what the creator got, whoever made up this prayer of give me the power to so-and-so, whoever made up Buddhism, whoever made up the in total Hindu philosophies, whoever made up uh, the first story that would seem to be the basis of the Faustus drama. No matter what, you can sit there and you could base your whole reputation. You might begin to rewrite the ideas of selling one's soul to questionable forces. You might begin to impress yourself. You may become famous over it, and it can be a splendid hobby. You know, who the hell cares? Me and you don't care. But insofar as you th believing that what I'm getting of course, people don't even worry about this, but I, I'm pointing out to you for a reason. Mainly, you shouldn't eat leftovers. No. Or if you do, which is a hobby, everybody eats leftovers, is don't take it seriously. Don't take it as real food. <laughs> but people can say, well, this story, or reading this prayer, I keep repeating this prayer. I keep rereading re this book I read one time. And certain ideas have such meaning. Okay. But I'm telling you for a fact, not psychological, not philosophical, no one, no one, no one, no matter how serious, no matter how sincere, the, the originator's son, daughter, the creator of anything, obtains from it, gets something from it that is never, ever available to any subsequent user. Also, for those of you looking for some excuse or for something else to think about, it might also, you might note that even out in the ordinary world, there are people that say, something sure is fishy. I spent my whole life trying to be a good Jew or a good Muslim, and I'll be damned, I still don't feel like, I'm being honest, I still don't feel like I'm up to the level of Abraham or my grandfather or Muhammad. I don't know. They're just not making Christians like Jesus anymore or Jews like Jesus. 
and it's a fact. But of course, then it goes into the same kind of ordinary view of life, the kind of critical view of them saying, well, it's just because life's going downhill. No, no, no. It's once something is broadcast, once something is painted, whoever did it, assuming there was something, we don't know. That's not even a question. If the creator got something out of it, the originator, whatever he got, whatever she got, was singular to them. After that, it's leftovers. It's a poor imitation. That is what the other people are getting. And I'm not questioning if they say, uh, hey, you can, sign, you can make that kind of statement, but I love going to church. I love studying the scriptures. I love looking at paintings. I love reading the philosophy from the at least post-Caesar Roman philosophers. I love it. I don't care what you say. You can love it. But I'm just pointing out, you can never get what the Creator got, and it doesn't have to be 2,000 years ago. It can be last week. It can be something that you heard somebody say yesterday. I said I couldn't resist doing that, but it's going to take too long, so I'm not going to go into that. Okay. Uh, but let's press onward, since I don't, I'm not going to stop. That, that whole thing I was just talking about takes too long, so we're not going to do that. About acting and not thinking. Of course, that doesn't mean you don't think, but act, not just think, and do, don't just talk. In regards to that, uh, there's something else that happens. As always, it's still based upon the flow of energy, but it manifests itself in a way that ordinary humans can hear, that it seems to have the big PMs, not that, uh, psychological manifestations. That is, if you're a particular interest in something, whatever it is, helping the watchless, anything in the secondary world, any sort of ordinary human activity, interest, concern, affair, hobby, dance, equation. If your concern manifests itself, let us say more or less, solely in thought and talk, it will inevitably result in the following. Quote, worry about the interest. Now, ordinary people, if they heard the sentence, which even for us, I su submit, maybe you're expecting worse, but the sentence actually made sense. In case you're... Ordinary people might say, well, wait a minute. Particularly in areas such as you're talking about, particular charitable affairs or many of the ordinary affairs of life, that would be quite normal. That if I were wanting to help the watch list, to use your silly example, they're saying to me, I'm playing their part again. For those of you that keep wondering, who the hell is that talking? <laughs> of course, some of the people that try to write and say, well, what is it when you sound like you're talking to somebody else and you're trying to refute what you said, and I get to listening, and then they ask me, does my letter make any sense or am I doing it to myself? <laughs> Ordinary intelligence could say, well, if I heard what you just said, then that, that really makes no sense because if you had an interest in something such as helping the help, the watchless, as silly as that sound, but if, the, if that was a real concern, then you should be worried about it. Why would you go and try to help somebody and take over those poor people who have no personal timepieces and you go over and you, out of your own goodness, your heart and your own money, you buy them watches? Certainly you worry over it. No, 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 no. That's all right. But that is not your personal interest. Life obviously has some interest in it. Life had enough interest that in some area it banned or put a control on the private ownership of watches. And so if it had that interest, it also has interest the other way around. Because even life has to dance with itself. So for the time being, whoever's leading that dance turned out to be control of watch ownership now is in the lead mode. But there's also somebody dancing backwards that did not want it. People who are now out in the cold with no watches. You follow? So, getting those who do not have watches, that is, helping the watchless, even though life in some area, well, let's say the whole planet, I don't want to get you distracted, but let's say the whole planet, circa 1991, suddenly all the countries get together through the auspices of the UN, they decide, hey, no more private ownership of watches will be better off. And so everybody says, all right. So you think, well, by God, it's worldwide. No, no, no. 
There's going to be all kinds of people who don't have watches that suddenly want watches, right? You know that. I can look at some of you and tell. Not just that, if they, did, if they just announced nobody can eat Fig Newtons anymore and you never had one in your life, you would suddenly, I know some of you people, I can see the look, you'd think, I'm going to get a Fig Newton or somebody's going to die. <laughs> right? So just because it would seem that life's interest is, all right, no one on this planet right now can own a watch. That is not in toto. Or it'd be, it'd be suicidal. There's going to be a large number of people that suddenly won't watch us. Don't ask me why. Because there is no why. So, I just want you to see if you thought, well, it would have to be my own private interest. Now, you're saying that there's suddenly a worldwide ban on watch ownership, private ownership, and then you're saying that there could be a person here and there, even an intelligent, reasonable person, that decide, I'm going to help all those people who now have no watches and actually want them. And so it's got to be my private interest. No, no, no. Remember, Half of anything that's going on is, half of it is what appears not to be going on. So if it appears that life's interest in the great question of private ownership of watches or not, if it appears to be that life's interest right now is to have no more private ownership, at least half of its interest is contrary. So just by you saying, well, I'm doing something that is against the general flow, that doesn't mean it's your private interest. It can still be life's interest. And I was trying to give you a way that a person could, if they needed to, even get some sort of gauge as to your own revolutionist intent in the interest you're pursuing. That is, if you think, well, I'm trying to do something that seems to be charitable. Let's stay with that because it's easier to turn the light on it. And, of course, you can realize I use helping the watch list kind of metaphorical because that really represents other important things like helping people without CD players. You know, real important stuff. And so you could, you could say, well, I have interests that are of a charitable nature. I want to help people in a certain way. But you're saying that life could also have the interest, right? Then if you're trying to get some sort of gauge, and this, of course, has no importance operationally, because if you've got to do this, you know, you're still in the play yard anyway. But we just describe it sometimes like, well, you could do this. This could be a self-test to see how you're doing. And of course, if you're dumb enough to say, well, good, I'll do that. I'll give myself a test and see how I'm doing. That's all right. Now you got a new hobby. You know, how dumb am I? Of course, I don't call it that. I call it something else. And you think, yes, I'm taking a test. But it's really, how stupid can I be? You know? At any rate, the one, one gauge is, you're in this activity. Are you worried about it? But again, if you're ordinary, you can say, well, that's silly. To say the least, because if I'm trying to help somebody, sure I'm worried about it. Do you have to talk about it to somebody? Remember, you know, I'm thinking the example of the guy that goes over and he keeps taking the people, the, this family with no watches, he keeps taking them every week. Every time he can afford it, he takes a new member of the family a watch. And let's say that he is really doing his imitation of... Mother Teresa doing her imitation of somebody, and he doesn't say anything. And they even say, who are you, you great benefactor, so we could light a candle, you know, at least say your name. He says, no, I prefer to do my charitable work unanimously. And they say, that's anonymously. And he said, oh, okay. And so if we were sitting there doing some kind of little movie, you could think, well, now there is a man approaching, if not sainthood, you know, at least he's getting close to his car when he's leaving. <laughs> but for a real revolutionist, that doesn't count. All right, it counts, but it's not enough. Because is he talking to himself? In the example we pushed it last time, I was also pointing out, you could say, well, I'm being charitable, and he says, I want to be mysterious. And he even comes in, he covers his face. He says, I don't want you to know who I am. I just want to help. And after he's done this for three or four weeks or for a while, and the family finally says, uh, we appreciate all the watches and what you've done, but could you start bringing them uh, in gold? I'd like one. I'd like a better one. And so let's say the guy still is doing this imitation, and he controls himself, except internally he says, screw you. Or he says anything. I just use that to get your attention, which doesn't work much anymore, since most of you went and found out what that means. <coughs> if he says anything, if you have to talk about it, and it doesn't have to be in just some sort of apparent reaction to them, if you're talking about before you go up there every week and you're out there and you're doing without your second cup of coffee 
at work so that you can save a little money. And you're thinking to yourself, anything. I can go ahead and put words, and it normally sounds like, again, some critique, which it doesn't. But let's say that you're saving, I don't have a cup of coffee, and it makes you feel warm, that you know. Everybody's just saying, well, let's get another cup, Joe. And you go, well, no, nah, I, I, I don't want any more coffee. And you really do. But you're thinking, well, that'll be another 50 cents I can put toward the fund to buy the watchless family another watch this week. If you're having to talk about it, <clears throat> if you still believe that it's your personal hobby as opposed to you for helping life pursue its hobbies, its interests, may I suggest to you, as time is getting short, that you're full of it. <laughs> oh. May I suggest that perhaps your sight is not as keen as it might be. Might I suggest that you are still involved with a certain entanglement, that your interest, let us say that your interest is in charitable work such as helping the watchless, and that life also has such an interest, and may I suggest that they may be intertwined to a certain degree. Sure. You could, I could put it to you crudely, crudely or a real revolutionist pursuing his own interest wouldn't actually talk about the interest. Wouldn't, let's we'll make it easy and hard. Just put this part in quotation marks and underline it or put wiggly lines around it. A real revolutionist in his interest would not, he wouldn't actually talk about his interest. Wouldn't actually talk about. All right. Wouldn't, wouldn't need to. People always like that better because then it go, well, that's, yeah, 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 I can see that. Because then it's become sort of what? Theoretical. Because what can you do if someone insisted, wait a minute, it's an actual fact that you're not pursuing your own intellectual secondary interest, whatever it is, charitable work, going back to school, trying to change occupations, it's not really your interest if you're having to talk about it. Not just overtly, but even to yourself. And you can tell it to somebody, even you people. And if you're listening at the ordinary level, just more or less, you can think, well, that sentence is almost intriguing in its complexity, if not abstruseness. And so maybe it has some significance. Well, you know, what the hell? How can you have an interest and not think about it? But then if you, if you hear, well, wait a minute, maybe I should restate that. A real revolutionist pursuing his interest in that way wouldn't have to necessarily. Then you go, oh. See, because then it's sort of like, well, hell, when I'm doing my best, I still think about what I'm doing. You might have been doing all this effort, and now it's not like somebody kicked me in my private parts. But then the message gets changed. Nah, it doesn't mean that that's true, but it means that you wouldn't necessarily be involved. Ah, oh. Nobody like that? I remember the guy on the bus. Well, I hate to hold you hostage, plus I didn't bring my pistol. Uh, give it to you quick, in a certain way, that a, if your participation is one of worry, and we can't, there's no profit in trying to slice and fool around with the words forever. If you have to worry, whatever it is, that you worry, you have to worry about your interest then I give you my personal guarantee. How's it come we finally get more and more specific as the clock runs down? Because that's the way the damn universe is. I assure you, compared to what we're talking about, if you have to worry about what your interest is, I give you an assurance. The laws of physics, not yet fully understood here, and quite possibly never, but I give you an assurance that you are pursuing life's aims you're pursuing life's interest. Nothing wrong with it. But if you think it's your interest, I give you, as always, or try to, a couple of ways out. You're either mistaken, you're ordinary, or maybe you don't feel good. I don't know. <laughs> but there's no doubt it cannot be proven, certainly. And if it could, nobody would. But it cannot be proven to tell somebody out in life, wait a minute, you think your interest is learning how to repair brass instruments? using only the healing touch of a new age 
crystal gazer that you can patch up rusted holes and trombones and baritone horns. Whatever it is, if you say yes, nobody can prove you wrong. But if you have to think about it, if you have to worry, 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 think about it, worry. If you have to worry about the interest, all right, let's don't be silly. Helping people who really seem to be less fortunate than you in life. This is not all just something silly. If you have to worry about it, you are helping life pursue its interest. It just so happens that yours cold inside. Just so happens. <laughs> well, that's the name of life. The great coincidence. Well, I seem to be a, a short, fat, dumb, ugly person. And boy, isn't it a coincidence that I could get a job setting up pens here in the bowling alley in the night shift where nobody can see me. No, isn't life, isn't life great? If it wasn't for that, I'd probably be out of work myself. You know, wouldn't most of us. That's the name of life is the great convenience, the great coincidence. If there's any way that someone's looking after their own interest, let's put it on the with all basis. Rather than that, your interest, again, as always, in some way, is going to be an area similar that life already has an interest or you wouldn't have it. But if you can pursue what it is you're doing and you're not worrying about it, that you're not subject to being wounded by it, that you do not have to talk about it, even here, then I suggest to you that the interest is a different matter. And this is not all theoretical because this happens to people in life. It happens to people in life that do not really qualify, as we've been calling it, is being an active participant in a, some neural revolution. It normally occurs in areas that seem to be genius of the intellect, seem to be genius artistically, and it's just people, they just do it. There's another reason that's kind of beside the point is why I'm talking about the ordinary sense, just out there in life that they say, well, here's, you know, Mozart's a genius, Einstein's a genius. Titian was a genius. And they try to interview these people and say, God, you're a genius. And of course, they'll accept that, if you say so. And they say, oh, we love you. What a genius. Tell us how it is to be a genius. How do you exercise your geniusness? Just tell us all about being genius. And suddenly, Einstein, Titian, Picasso, they all go, uh, uh, well, uh, well, hey, it's, you, know, you know, it's like, well, I guess... I mean, I don't like, I, I, I don't feel all that much different. I, you know, like it's, you don't, I don't sit around. I mean, if that's, I don't like think I, well, I'm a genius and I don't think, well, like, boy. You know. I mean, it's really inspiring. Now, I'm not the first to have noted that. And it's not making fun. It is, they, they can't get to this point. I mean, the dance is not this way, but the interviewer could say, wait a minute. Now, I, don't, I see you make a fool of yourself or... Plus, my show's going down the drain here. You didn't. Is it this? I never thought about it, says the interviewer. Is it this? That somebody that has a kind of genius in your field, whatever it was, can't really describe it. <laughs> See, nobody, nobody ever even asked that. I'm sure somebody said it, but they said it. Then, after that, it was a short thing to probably that one that's plagued old, uh, what's his, Hitchcock for years, of him saying all great actors are, you know, like cattle, dumb kids, which is the same kind of thing that if somebody ordinarily did say, wait a minute, geniuses, artistic geniuses can't describe what they do because it's some way tied to genius, but then it becomes, on, from their view, pejorative. It becomes an attack. Like, well, boy, I'm glad I'm not a genius if that's the case, which again, may I point out the huge coincidence. <laughs> Just for you to... You just say, boy, I used to, I used to be impressed. I used, I used to love, you know, John Lennon, Chuck Berry. Uh, did anybody ever love Papa Bronze? And they say, until I met the son of a bitch, and he could hardly talk. You know, if that's genius, now I still like his music or his fingers, right? But if that's genius, just between me and you, you know, I'm kind of glad I'm not. Talk about fortuitousness. <laughs> Talk about the great coincidence. Well, I'm glad I'm not a genius. Well, I'm glad, you know, and reality said, that one reality said, well, glad I could be of service. <laughs> you're glad you're not a genius? And hey, it worked out just right. <laughs> Back to the main subject, or where I was right there, if you recall, there is a reason they can't. 
And it's not psychological, and it's not because genius drains all of your common sense and makes your tongue... <laughs> it's not that. It's that what I was pointing out was of really no importance to anybody doing... Well, it should be of no practical sidetracking to you. But out in the ordinary world, when it even gets close to people, being able to just do it, which normally is called genius. They can't describe it for one reason. It's nothing not that unusual. They've got no idea what's going on either. A genius out in the ordinary world has no more idea what's going on than an idiot does in the clinical sense. You understand? In other words, a non-genius, the most ordinary person in the world, your partner, Maybe a knuckle you got. Maybe you. But the most ordinary person in the world, you know, a guy laying in the gutter, a bricklayer between bricks, a musician temporarily out of work, just somebody ordinary, just, just half drunk out of their mind, and you say, you know, what brought you to this place in life? They can't tell you any more than you can find the poet laureate of Yugoslavia today if it had one then you could take a Norman Mailer, whoever would be a living great person of some kind. All the great people. Bernstein, if we were doing this six months ago. Somebody still alive that's famous and great. You ask a genius, Motherwell, somebody. How do you do this? They cannot tell you anymore. There's no difference, really. They cannot tell you what it is, how they are a genius anymore than this drunken bricklayer, this guy staggering around in a bar with no talent, no nothing. And you say, what brought you here? Whatever story he tells you is no better, no more in exemplary, no more instructive than it would be for a genius. By their definition, I'm not questioning, by a genius saying, well, uh, uh, well, like, you know, it's, uh, well, uh, you know, that's a hard, I don't, well, that's a hard, I don't, I, it's the same thing. That's why, I, one of the reasons I was saying if you want some sort of gauge if you have an interest and you can pursue it and not talk about it, not worry about it, then I'm suggesting to you that it may be in some way possibly diverging, separating, even if it's still part of life's interest, which is always in some area similar to life has its own interest there. Life needs paintings. Life needs music. And so you can't say, well, I'm the only person in the world trying to write music. No, you know that's not true. But you can also. Don't just say, well i got to find something that life has no interest in, and that would be the only thing I could you know, really come up with. Yeah. Give yourself a break. So the area is going to be similar, but if you, can, if you find that you can pursue what seems to be yours in a way in which you do not have to worry over it, I'm suggesting then that you may be getting close to where a man or woman's individual interest might begin to separate from similar areas that life is pursuing. But I can assure you from a most physical, even mathematical, I hope that didn't make anyone's nose bleed, <laughs> a dimensional assurance that if you're having to worry about your interest, you are supporting life's interest. You are still working for the home office, which is fine, but it is not your personal interest. There is no diverging, much less any real noticeable separation between your interest and life's interest. But everyone believes otherwise. There's nothing wrong with it. But if you're going to try and relieve yourself of some of the unnecessary entanglements, you've got to see that no matter how laudable may seem to be your interest, such as charitable work, if you worry over it, whether it be that or if it appears to be real personal and selfish, I want to be a famous painter. It doesn't matter. All the way from what would seem to be selflessness to selfishness. If you worry about it, you are pursuing life's aims. You're helping life look after its interest. And you may have, your interest may be similar. You may go ahead and spend 70 years doing charitable work, being a priest, a rabbi. You may spend 70 years painting. And I, I don't care. Do you care? Sure, you don't care. Nobody cares. But if you're worried about all that time, I'm telling you, you are not actually pursuing your interest in any way that was separate at all from life's interest. Because life has an interest in painters, symphonies, charitable work. Well, what can you say after you're out of time? 